Chapters 25 through 28 of Acts from the World English Bible. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vivian Bush. Acts from the World English Bible. Chapters 25 through 28. Festus, therefore, having come into the province, after three days went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. Then the high priest and the principal men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they begged him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem, plotting to kill him on the way. However, Festus answered that Paul should be kept in custody at Caesarea, and that he himself was about to depart shortly. Let them therefore, said he, that are in power among you, go down with me, and if there is anything wrong in the man, let them accuse him. When he had stayed among them more than ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and on the next day he sat on the judgment seat, and commanded Paul to be brought. When he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing against him many and grievous charges which they could not prove, while he said in his defense, Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I sinned at all. But Festus, desiring to gain favor with the Jews, answered Paul, and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and be judged by me there concerning these things? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also know very well. For if I have done wrong, and have committed anything worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. But if none of those things is true that they accuse me of, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, you have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea, and greeted Festus. As he stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priest and the elders of the Jews informed me, asking for a sentence against him. To whom I answered that it is not the custom of the Romans to give up any man to destruction, before the accused has met the accusers face to face, and has had opportunity to make his defense concerning the matter laid against him. When, therefore, they had come together here, I didn't delay, but on the next day sat on the judgment seat, and commanded the man to be brought. Concerning whom, when the accuser stood up, they brought no charge of such things as I supposed but had certain questions against him about their own religion, and about one Jesus, who was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Being perplexed how to inquire concerning these things, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be kept for the decision of the emperor, I commanded him to be kept until I could send him to Caesar. Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So on the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp, and they had entered into the place of hearing with the commanding officers and principal men of the city, at the command of Festus Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men who are here present with us, you see this man, about whom all the multitude of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and as he himself appealed to the emperor, I determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write, my lord. Therefore I have brought him forth before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, that after examination I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable, in sending a prisoner, not to also specify the charges against him. Agrippa said to Paul, You may speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand, and made his defense. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, that I am to make my defense before you this day concerning all the things that I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Therefore I beg you to hear me patiently. Indeed, all the Jews know my way of life from my youth up, which was from the beginning among my own nation and at Jerusalem, having known me from the first, if they are willing to testify, that after the strictest sect of our religion I lived a Pharisee. Now I stand here to be judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, which our twelve tribes, earnestly serving night and day, hope to attain. Concerning this hope I am accused by the Jews, King Agrippa. Why is it judged incredible with you, if God does raise the dead? 
I myself most certainly thought that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. I both shut up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death I gave my vote against them. Punishing them often in all the synagogues, I tried to make them blaspheme. Being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Whereupon as I traveled to Damascus with the authority and commission from the chief priest, at noon, O king, I saw on the way a light from the sky, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who traveled with me. When we had all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you a servant and a witness, both of the things which you have seen, and of the things which I will reveal to you, delivering you from the people, and from the Gentiles, to whom I send you, to open their eyes, that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive remission of sins, and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to them of Damascus at Jerusalem, and throughout all the country of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, doing works worthy of repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple, and tried to kill me. Having therefore obtained the help that is from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would happen, how the Christ must suffer, and how, by the resurrection of the dead, he would be first to proclaim light both to these people and to the Gentiles. As he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are crazy. Your great learning is driving you insane. But he said, I am not crazy, most excellent Festus, but boldly declare words of truth and reasonableness. For the king knows of these things, to whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things is hidden from him, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, With a little persuasion, are you trying to make me a Christian? Paul said, I pray to God that whether with little or with much, not only you, but also all that hear me this day, might become such as I am, except for these bonds. The king rose up with the governor, and Bernice, and those who sat with them. When they had withdrawn, they spoke to one another, saying, This man does nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. When it was determined that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners to a centurion named Julius, of the Augustan band. Embarking in a ship of Adramidium, which was about to sail to places on the coast of Asia, we put to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. The next day we touched at Sidon. Julius treated Paul kindly, and gave him permission to go to his friends and refresh himself. Putting to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed across the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days, and had come with difficulty opposite Snidius, the wind not allowing us further, we sailed under the lee of Crete, opposite Salmone. With difficulty sailing along it, we came to a certain place called Fair Havens, near the city of Lycia. When much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous, because the fast had now already gone by, Paul admonished them, and said to them, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion gave more heed to the master and to the owner of the ship than to those things which were spoken by Paul. Because the haven was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised going to sea from there, if by any means they could reach Phoenix and winter there, which is a port of Crete, looking northeast and southeast. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to shore. But before long a stormy wind beat down from shore, which is called Euroclidon. When the ship was caught and couldn't face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Clauda, 
we were able with difficulty to secure the boat. After they had hoisted it up, they used cables to help reinforce the ship. Fearing that they would run aground on the citrus sandbars, they lowered the sea anchor, and so were driven along. As we labored exceedingly with the storm, the next day they began to throw things overboard. On the third day they threw out the ship's tackle with their own hands. When neither the sun nor stars shone on us for many days, and no small storm pressed on us, all hope that we would be saved was now taken away. When they had been long without food, Paul stood up in the middle of them and said, Sirs, you should have listened to me, and not have set sail from Crete, and have gotten this injury and loss. Now I exhort you to cheer up, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel, belonging to the God whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. Behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, sirs, cheer up. For I believe, God, that it will be just as it has been spoken to me. But we must run aground on a certain island. But when the fourteenth night had come, as we were driven back and forth in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors surmised that they were drawing near to some land. They took soundings and found twenty fathoms. After a little while they took soundings again and found fifteen fathoms. Fearing that we would run aground on rocky ground, they let go four anchors from the stern, and wished for daylight. As the sailors were trying to flee out of the ship, and had lowered the boats into the sea, pretending that they would lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these stay in the ship, you can't be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the boat, and let it fall off. While the day was coming on, Paul begged them all to take some food, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that you wait and continue fasting, having taken nothing. Therefore I beg you to take some food, for this is for your safety, for not a hair will perish from any of your heads. When he had said this, and had taken bread, he gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. Then they all cheered up, and they also took food. In all we were two hundred seventy-six souls on the ship. When they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. When it was day, they didn't recognize the land, but they noticed a certain bay with a beach, and they decided to try to drive the ship onto it. Casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, at the same time untying the rudder ropes. Hoisting up the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But coming to a place where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground. The bow struck and remained immovable, but the stern began to break up by the violence of the waves. The soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim out and escape. But the centurion, desiring to save Paul, stopped them from their purpose, and commanded that those who could swim should throw themselves overboard first to go toward the land, and the rest should follow, some on planks and some on other things from the ship. So it happened that they all escaped safely to the land. When we had escaped, then they learned that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us uncommon kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us all, because of the present rain and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said one to another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he has escaped from the sea, yet justice is not allowed to live. However, he shook off the creature into the fire, and wasn't harmed. But they expected that he would have swollen, or fallen down dead suddenly. But when they watched for a long time, and saw nothing bad happen to him, they changed their minds, and said that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island, named Publius, who received us, and courteously entertained us for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick of fever and dysentery. Paul entered into him, prayed, and laying his hands on him, healed him. Then when this was done, the rest also who had diseases in the island came, and were cured. They also honored us with many honors, and when we sailed, they put on board the things that we needed. After three months we set sail in a ship of Alexandria which had wintered in the island, whose sign was the Twin Brothers. Touching at Syracuse, we stayed there three days. From there we circled around and arrived at Regium. After one day a south wind sprang up, and on the second day we came to Petuoli, where we found brothers, 
and were entreated to stay with them for seven days. So we came to Rome. From there the brothers, when they heard of us, came to meet us as far as the market of Appius and the three taverns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. When we entered into Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. It happened that after three days Paul called together those who were the leaders of the Jews. When they had come together, he said to them, I, brothers, though I had done nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, still was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, desired to set me free, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was constrained to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything about which to accuse my nation. For this cause, therefore, I asked to see you and to speak with you, for because of the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. They said to him, We neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor did any of the brothers come here and report or speak any evil of you. But we desire to hear from you what you think, for as concerning this sect, it is known to us that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed him a day, many people came to him at his lodging. He explained to them, testifying about the kingdom of God, and persuading them concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets, from morning until evening. Some believed the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. When they didn't agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had spoken one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet, to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, In hearing you will hear, but will in no way understand. In seeing you will see, but will in no way perceive. For this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and would turn again, and I would heal them. Be it known therefore to you that the salvation of God is sent to the nations. They will also listen. When he had said these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house, and received all who were coming to him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, without hindrance. End of the Book of Acts Recording by Vivian Bush, Houston, Texas, on October 18, 2007